Good morning, church. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Crossville, Tennessee. Looking out the window off to the side here. Hope everything is going well for you guys way over there. Our text for this morning comes in this um, season after Easter, which oftentimes focuses on the life of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And much of that from... Uh, the night before his death where he makes this series of long speeches kind of digs into those and so our text is from uh, John 14 and it's not very long of a reading but I want to do it a slightly different way this morning than the way we normally do it I want to read it slowly and then I want to offer uh, some brief reflections on it or brief prompts for you to reflect on it before we go back and we read it one more time and then we'll conclude with some thoughts that comprise the sermon. Uh, but as we read through this, settle into a comfortable position, uh, let the words wash over you, enter into the story. Put yourself in the upper room with Jesus and the disciples. What would it have been like to be there with Jesus saying these words to you? And so, for instance, just as an initial prompt, he begins with the words in verse 1 of John 14, don't be troubled. And so, what would the disciples have had to be troubled about? Um, what do you have to be troubled about today? And what would it do for you, for Jesus to say to you, sitting in the room next to you, with all of the things going on in your life and in the world around us, don't be troubled. And so just put yourself in the room. You're part of that Last Supper. You're inside of this story. Jesus is speaking to you. And then when we're done, we will uh, maintain just a moment of silence for you to pay attention to what maybe stuck out to you, what spoke to you, a thought that occurred to you. Take this time to reflect on that, to turn it around, to be in prayer about this text. John 14, starting in verse 1. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has room to spare, and if that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I'm going. Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you have really known me, you will also know the Father. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. Jesus replied, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been with you all this time, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Just take a moment and sit with the text. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Jesus says, trust in me. With everything going on in our lives, what does it mean for us to take that admonition, command, that encouragement of Jesus and make it real in your life? What would it have been like to be in that upper room and hear those words, having gone through everything that Jesus and his disciples had gone through? What stuck out to you? What thought got caught in your mind as you were listening to this text? Spend just a moment with it. Maybe jot it down, return to it later in the day and give it to God.
Now as we get ready to transition into the sermon, let's read it one more time. Hear the word of God. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My father's house has room to spare, and if that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me, so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I'm going. Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you really have known me, you will also know the Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, that we, and this will be enough for us. Jesus replied, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been with you all this time, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? It's interesting, this text started off um, doing one thing in my mind this week, but the more time I spent with it, it really turned into something else. I, uh, some point along the way, started thinking about that old song that we love to sing that was inspired by uh, this text along with a few others. It is a song that I'm not going to sing for you. Since we're all on video, I could trust that you would sing with me if I started singing it because you know it as well as I do. But I know how you are. You're not going to sing. You're just going to leave me hanging by myself. And then you're going to have to listen to this horrible voice, especially in the morning, not enough caffeine, haven't been up long enough. And so I'm not going to sing it, but I'm thinking of that song, Mansions Over the Hilltop. And the more I sat with this text this week, the more I thought about uh, my complicated relationship with that song. I mean, I love that song, but I also am always prompted to deeper thought when I sing that song in ways that sometimes make me uncomfortable, sometimes challenge me. I mean, for starters, the, the way the song starts is simple enough. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver, a little gold. It is a song that at the very least ought to remind us that when we sing to God or or sing about God, we should probably tell the truth. And so it always prompts uneasy questions. Am I satisfied with just a cottage below? Um, With a little silver, with a little gold? And at best, it is a statement of my contentment. When I'm doing well, I can be content with that. At other times, it calls me on my deep hypocrisy when I'm singing this song that is not precisely true. But also, it's a song, rather, that um, asks me every time I sing it, what are you in this for? Uh, I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver, a little gold, and then it goes on to talk about, but that's okay because one day I will have a mansion. And I often wonder when I'm singing songs like that if the mansion is what we're actually after here. Uh, There's a theologian and philosopher who wrote a series of modern day parables. And I remember there was this one parable I told at church when we were in Texas once. And, And just to make it quick, it goes something like this. Imagine that you die and you go to heaven and you enter into the pearly gates and you're ushered into the throne room and it's obvious the throne room is there the crystal sea and the big throne down at the end and this glorious being stand sitting on the throne and as you walk in he stands and he raises his arms out wide and embrace and with a smile and laughter in his eyes he says welcome to heaven and he says my name is lucifer And there's been a battle, and we won, and your God, your Lord Jesus, have been consigned to the pits of hell. And then he says, and this is the point of the parable, he says, now you have to make a decision. He said, you can choose to stay in heaven with all of its splendor and its perfection and its glory and all of the blessings and all of the cool things, the mansions and the streets of gold. All of it can be yours if only you will worship me. But if you insist on being faithful to your Lord, then you can spend eternity with him there. 
And of course, what the parable does, it's the same thing the song, Mansions Over the Hilltop, causes me to ponder. Do we want to go to heaven, as it were, because of the mansions and the streets of gold? And I'm really down here with my cottage and my little silver and my little gold, but everybody knows we want more than that. Or do I want to go there because that is where Jesus is? Or more, perhaps, maybe the question is the, the one that's raised with Job. It's the only reason I want to be with Jesus is because he gives me mansions and streets of gold. And so I love this song because it prompts me, it challenges me to wonder why I'm in this. Am I just in this because God gives me good gifts? Or am I in this because I love God? And of course, that's one of the emphases of the text. The older translations say there are many mansions in my father's house. That is actually a bad translation. The root, 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 oh, I can't talk this morning. The word for house is more like a hotel. So there's lots of rooms in my father's house. But the emphasis throughout the text is not on going somewhere where there's all this really cool stuff, but the emphasis is on being with God. On being in fellowship with God. As a matter of fact, when Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, the place that he is preparing is room in fellowship with God. That's what he's going to do in the context of John 14. This preparation that he's making is not that he's going to go off beyond the bright blue and, and build this big mansion hotel type thing made of gold and all sorts of precious metals where there are rooms, but He's getting ready to go to Calvary. He's getting ready to go to the cross. He's getting ready to die and affect the defeat of death. He's getting ready to go to the grave and be vindicated in the resurrection. He's getting ready to ascend to the throne and send the Spirit. And in that process of death and burial and resurrection and ascension and sending the Spirit, we are ushered back into fellowship with God. We are ushered back into a life where we live with God. And so... This text is not so much about what happens after we die or where we go when we die, although what happens in eternity is certainly a part of the story. But it's a text about being with God. It's a text about being with God and that God has always wanted us to be with him, that God has created us to be with him. This is the way it has been since the very beginning. God created the garden, and he puts us in fellowship with him in the garden. That is what was lost. That is what was broken. This is the way it is at the end of the story when with new heavens and new earth, the new Jerusalem that we so often think of, that holy city, comes from heaven down to earth, and God dwells with us in that city in his restored creation. And the point is not what is that creation going to be like or what are the metaphysics of it going to be like or how are the details going to work out or how big is my mansion going to be or what kind of streets are paved with gold and how does that do with my suspension. Um, but rather we will be with God. And so Jesus says in the midst of all of their troubles in the midst of all of the trials that they are facing, he, he says, don't be troubled. All of this that you experience that is a product, product of our broken world is fading away, is passing away, and I am opening a way for you to come back to what you were always meant to be, what God always created you to be, to be in the relationship that you were made for at the deep, deepest level. This is where I'm bringing you and he says, you already know the way there. And the disciples say, what are you talking about? We don't even get where you're going yet. What is the way there? And he says, the way there is me. And I suspect that just as much as I need to think about why I'm interested in the afterlife at all, is it mansions or is it streets of gold or would I go to be with God because God is worth being with even without all of that? I suspect I also need to think on the regular about that way to life with God that Jesus opens up. 
You see, because of what God is bringing us is life as it is always meant to be life with him. And this is what we were created for, the, the good life, human flourishing, full human dignity being what we were made to be. Then we in our world have all sorts of ideas about what that's supposed to look like. And we have all sorts of ways of saying the way to that life is this or that thing or the other thing. And Jesus says, but you realize you already know the way, and that's me. And here Jesus is not just talking about following a set of rules. Let's not suppose that we know the way just because we check off all of the things on a list. I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this, and don't you know I went to church every Sunday, and I always turned to every scripture in my Bible, and I sang every song, no matter how off-key it was, and I said my prayers every morning. Let's not assume that we impress God or somehow convince him to let us into the way because of the things we've done, or the correctness of our theology, or the rightness of our doctrine, or our superiority over other groups up and down the road from us. That's not the way of Jesus. And it doesn't come through uh, some economic or political agenda, even though there are voices from both sides of the aisle that would decry that or cry that out, who would try to tempt us away from that. It's not that those don't make a difference or that they have no impact on our world, but that's never going to get us where we want to go. But ultimately, it's through Jesus not just saying we believe in Jesus, not just affirming beliefs about Jesus, not just checking off doctrines that are somehow we think related to Jesus, assuming that we get our interpretation correct, but in actually following Jesus and pledging our allegiance to Jesus and taking up our crosses and going after Jesus into his way of life. That is where life is found. That is where the Father is found. And so um, I'm finished with school now, and I told the elders a few weeks ago that when I'd finished with school, we would see about getting uh, some sort of virtual Sunday school thing going. And I think what I want to do is starting next week, I will start posting videos on the book of Colossians. And I'll go ahead and give you like a one-minute introduction here. Uh, the, bu the book of Colossians, I love the way it puts it, is John 14 to the core. The book of Colossians is a book where Paul is writing to a church that's got a lot of things going for them, but they're starting to wander off the path just a little bit. They're starting to flirt with this um, new idea that is starting to rise up in the world that says, you need Jesus, and Jesus is important, but really you need Jesus and this other set of things, Jesus plus And so Paul writes them and he says, it's obvious that you don't understand Jesus as much as you should. Because anytime you say you need Jesus plus, it just means you need to dig more into Jesus. And so Paul spends that chapter not point by point refuting the false doctrine, not spending all of his time telling them how wrong they are, but telling them about the glory and the fullness and the bigness and the beauty of Jesus. The world is dark and it's full of terrors. It's full of anxiety and hardship and things that we never should have had to face. But in the midst of that darkness, Jesus says, do not be troubled. And do not be afraid, because God will never let this world have the last say. He has more in mind, and Jesus is the one who brings us back to God. And he says very simply, lean in to me. Follow me. And that's what we're about. Okay, let's pray, and then we will... Um, Remind ourselves of why we are here. And then I'm going to let you guys loose on the world in whatever wise and creative and responsible ways you can think of this week. We miss you guys and we can't wait to see you again. But for now, let's go to God in prayer. 
Father, we simply ask that you place Jesus at the center of our lives. We pray that he would shape everything we do, everything we imagine, everything we desire, that we would increasingly be a people of his way, that we would follow him to his way of life, with every ounce of who we are. And now we come to you and we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And a second one like it is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commands depend all the law and the prophets. We love because God first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates a brother or sister, he is a liar. Because the person who doesn't love a brother or sister who they have seen cannot love God who they have not seen. This commandment we have from him, those who claim to love God ought also to love their brothers and sisters. Go with Jesus this week, church. Be blessed. We love you. We'll see you next week.